You're listening to Encyclopedia Podcastica, a podcast from the Silicon Valley skeptics. Prepare your mind. Hi, and welcome to Encyclopedia Podcastica. I'm your host, Hunter Perrin. And I'm Matt Courtney. Encyclopedia Podcastica is recorded in front of a live studio audience. (laughs) That is our wonderful studio audience. So, Matt. Yes, Hunter? Did you know that the sun is a painter and the atmosphere is his canvas? I did not know that. Yes, that's what I'm going with. Okay. Is it watercolors? Uh, It's light colors. Light colors? Wait, all color is light. Um, Yeah, that doesn't really work. It's... It's not clouds. Oxygen color. Oh, okay. And nitrogen color. I don't know that. Technically, (laughs) that's true. It is both those things. Okay. Well, we'll get into that. (laughs) Because this podcast is about... Auroras! Or Aurorae. (laughs) Which is the better pronunciation? Right. Spelling. The spelling. The better spelling is Aurora. They're both realization. correct, or is there they not They are both really... correct. You can say Auroras, and you can say Aurora, but if you want to sound super smart and obnoxious, you say Aurora. So okay. that's what we're going to do, because we want to sound we were... super smart and obnoxious. Right, right, right. Yeah. That's the point of this podcast, right? Pretentious, I believe, is the word. Correct. Yeah. We're yes. a pretentious podcast. So, yeah. <laughs> with with <Anyway>. humor. <laughs> so, Aurora. 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 Also known as the Northern Lights, or the Southern Lights, or the Polar Lights, or Aurora Borealis, or Aurora Australis, which all refer to either both the the lights at the poles or one specific pole. Right. But Aurora in general. Yes. By the way, if you've seen Auroras, you're fucking lucky, and I'm so jealous, because I would love to see an Aurora. Right. Like, in real life. I've seen them on, like images of course but i've never seen an aurora in real life because i've never even been that far north or south yeah neither have i i grew up in florida that's like way too far south (laughs) (laughs) the closest i've been to where an aurora would be is like new york which okay i've been to new york also there have been auroras that have reached all the way down to to new york aurora (laughs) that reach all the way down to new york but it's (laughs) Very rare. You'd you'd need a very powerful aurora. Right. So let's talk about the history of aurora. Okay, there we go. History. So when do you think was the first recorded recorded incident of an aurora or some sort of recording? First recorded one? Recorded. Uh, I mean, obviously the hmm. first one was millions of years ago. We have one for Egyptians. Anybody in the audience? Any guesses? We have a winner. <laughs> ding, ding, Maybe. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get you some uh, M&Ms from, the, from somewhere at some point. So. <laughs> That's our prizes. That's our M&Ms. prize. I don't know. Uh, how about a pen? We can give him a pen right now. Okay. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Winner. Okay. Uh, so this is actually a maybe. Um, there is a Cro-Magnon cave painting dated at 30,000 BCE that, that scientists think may be paintings of Aurora. Oh, wow. Aurora, A. Uh, and it's in southern France. So that's like the earliest like possible recording. The first definite recording of uh, uh, Aurora is 2600 BCE from China. And I guess this was actually like written into like some text that they found somewhere along the line, and I did not write down who it was. <laughs> this is great. Matt, can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. I just realized I said Egyptians when I was guessing who the first to spot an aurora and record it was. Yeah. Not realizing that Africa, or at least like North <laughs> Africa, is. I didn't even think pretty, about it. Too. <laughs> pretty south. Oh, were, uh, pretty close to the equator. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, mentioned this pretty far a little later, from, but I think from both Egypt poles. is yeah too too far south. <laughs> that was yeah. a dumb guess. That's a pretty bad guess. <laughs> so okay, uh, blah, 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 blah. the mother of the Yellow Emperor, the Yellow Emperor being uh, Shan Yun, 
I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm, I'm going to have a lot of problems with pronunciation this uh, episode. I'm just going to tell you <laughs> up front. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so they, she recorded some, uh, wrote down something about seeing a strong lightning moving over. Or, okay, so saw a strong lightning moving around the star Sue. I have no idea what the star Sue is. <laughs> and uh, the text I was reading did not explain that. It belongs um, to the constellation of Beidou. Beidou. I'm just reading your notes. Yeah, you're reading my notes. And you're reading ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so the text says, uh, um, the light illuminated the whole area, and after that she became pregnant. So this is a... Uh, that is quite a powerful aurora. story, <laughs> yeah. It's like some serious aurora. Uh, that date, like, they know it's about 2600 BC. They don't know, like, exactly the date, the time or anything. Um, so the first actual, like, datable, uh, ob- observation, uh, which means, you know, they took them out for dinner or something. I, I don't know. <laughs> Boo. Uh, that was actually, uh, in a Babylonian text. Uh, 567 BCE on the 12th or the 13th of March. I think it's the 12th or the 13th because it's like the night. So it's not exactly, you know, which day <laughs> they're at when, when it actually was recorded. Um, observation was from the official astronomer, astronomers of King Nebu- Nebuchadnezzar, ah, nah. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar the second. That was that ship in the Matrix. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember how to pronounce it. Uh, oh, I know how to pronounce it. I just can't for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, so that that particular text describes an unusual red glow in the sky, in the night sky. So that's Babylonian. So, ooh, ooh, ooh! I can tell you what elements caused that glow because I know its color. But and you're gonna do yeah, it later. We'll do that later. <laughs> We'll do that in the science part of the, the <laughs> podcast. Uh, so there's a lot of other like uh, texts that d- describe the aurora and, and mention it in various forms and stuff. But the interesting story about Philip of Macedonia, who's famous not you know for what he did, but for having a a great son named Alexander. Alexander the Great was the son. If you didn't get that joke, nobody's paying attention. Okay. Was it a joke? <laughs> it was oh. a bad joke, okay? <laughs> yeah, there we go. 360 BCE, he, uh, Philip of Macedonia attacks the city of Byzantium. I got that one right. Uh, that sounds and, like an element. It does, doesn't it? Is it a city made entirely of the element Byzantium? Byzantium. No, I don't think so. Is that an, That's not an element. I don't think it's an element. Yeah. You're thinking of Aurelian. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it ended in the um, and that, that's what yeah, all the... Yeah, all the, the elements, elements end in the um, right? Not all, so, but most. Okay. Anyways, back to the story. So his, uh, his plan was to dig a tunnel under the walls of the city, wait for nightfall, and jump out and say, ha ha, we got your city. Well, okay, well, it's, it's going to take the city at night, basically, right? Hmm. Well, that night... There was a particularly strong aurora, and it actually lit up this night sky so much that it still like looked like day, basically. So they never actually jumped out, and the city was actually saved by the aurora. And it was such like a big, momentous occasion that the city actually struck a coin with an image. There's like an arc shape on the coin, to, which apparently is what the, at least part of the aurora looked like. Uh, and to commemorate the event. And that actually, that image still floats around to this day and some flags and that's so fucking cool. Yeah. That was pretty good. One of those coins. Yeah. There's probably really, you know, they don't make those coins anymore. So (laughs) they're probably like really expensive, highly sought after. I would settle for just seeing one of those coins. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. So it's a, it's kind of a crescent shape, which is supposed to look like an, uh, an auroral arc. But many people actually think that it's supposed to be a crescent moon. So a lot of people kind of get, get confused for that. But it's, in fact, an overall arc. Uh, so after that, there's some more, like, interesting uh, observations here and there. 
but um, at about the year 555, now we're, we're in C, Common Era, uh, the year 55, 555, uh, there was actually the beginning of an 1,000-year depression in auroras, at least the aurora borealis, uh, northern lights. And from about like 555 to the year 1500, there were, there were some mentions and, and uh, written observations, but there were far, far flu- fewer than there used to be. That was when the sun got into rock music and, and put down the paintbrush for a while. <laughs> oh, is that what happened? <laughs> They're going to say it was like became emo or something and didn't, you know, it was not doing colors anymore. It was, it was just rocking out. Just rocking out. Okay. It came back after September ended. Oh, right, right. Of course. So the uh, interesting thing happened uh, shortly before the year 1500, which was the uh, um, the printing press was invented. So when they started coming back, so it's not really clear how much of it was just people weren't recording them versus when the printing press comes out, now that they can actually like record and distribute information about auroras uh it just became more popular it's not real clear what what happened but there is definitely a lack of information for about a thousand years that's so weird i would think like if i saw an aurora i would absolutely record it on something anything whatever was right. around the right. leaf i'd just be like i saw a freaking aurora yeah yeah stick it on a bird's leg and tweet it out <laughs> It was the original form of Twitter. Yeah. So do you know where the name Aurora, and specifically Aurora Borealis, comes from? I do not. Without looking at the notes, because I have it written down in the notes. (laughs) (laughs) And you're a cheater. (laughs) Anybody in the audience? I'm throwing out questions. You know, random guesses. People's names. No. Russian? Because Boris Borealis, that's just that's a, that's a, <laughs> Egyptian. Egyptian. Egyptian? Going with Egyptian? Because they, they have it's real fine. good accents. <laughs> I would guess it's of Latin descent. Aura, A-U-R-A. Yeah, that's, that's, a that's pretty good. Uh, so the name is attributed to Galileo Galilei, who came up with the name. Aurora is the Roman goddess of morning or dawn. And Borealis is uh, comes from Boreas, the Greek name for the North Wind. So there is yet another reason to persecute Galileo because he's mixing Latin and Greek. <laughs> and then I don't know where Australis comes from. So I think Australis. it just means south, doesn't it? But yeah, that's just the southern lights. I, I tried looking up. There's a clear name for the, the Northern Lights. I don't know where the Southern hmm. Lights come from. If there are um, any Australians, <laughs> what does the name of your country mean? <laughs> we would like to know if, it's, everything's if it upside just means down. South. Yeah. What if we had named our country just North? America. Instead of, instead oh. of <laughs> well, we did kind of take <laughs> over the name America. <laughs> but instead of this... United States of America, that there's no easy, like, simple name, so we had to take over America. We could have just called it North. And then during the Civil War, the South could have been the South North. <laughs> <laughs> the South North will rise again! The North North will defeat you. <laughs> and then Canada would just be like the North North North. <laughs> The true right. North, 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 strong and free. <laughs> <laughs> that would mess up the cadence of the song a little bit. Right. So I wanted to throw in Galileo actually thought aurorae were caused by light reflecting from the atmosphere. And that is probably, until much later, the, like, the best explanation, even though we now know that's like totally wrong. So wrong. That's so wrong. <laughs> But, but you got to give the guy credit. I mean, he didn't have a lot of knowledge to work with, and, and not a lot of ways. He gave to really it his like best shot. Figure it out. And At least he wasn't thinking that there were like gods dancing around in the sky. Right. Right. That's a plus. Which some people thought, right? Or were there like candles in the sky or yeah. something like that? 
There's one myth that I read where they thought there were like children waving uh, sheets into the sky, colored <laughs> sheets somehow. What? That makes I'm, no sense. Why would yeah, anyone believe that? I don't know. And apparently there was another guy, a Russian, who thought that it was light reflecting from some like northern lake, like a lake on like the North Pole, and spent much of his life searching the North Pole for this lake. <laughs> <laughs> of course, never found it because we know that's not what happens. Anyways, back uh, after Galileo, there was another lack of aurora for a while but it wasn't a thousand years we don't have a thousand years we do have aurora again but there was the uh uh maunder maunder minimum yeah don't know if i can i'm really not doing so well on the pronunciation it looks like thing. maunder 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 minimum from 1621 to 1716 where there were almost no aurora borealis or sunspots that would make sense because the two are related they are related as we'll find out and this ends in a spectacular aurora in, on the 17th of March in 1716. Uh, so we're still not really sure what's going on with aurora, but an interesting development happens in the 1800s, specifically September 2nd, 1859. There's an extreme auroral event, big aurora, right? Well, at this time, telegraph is invented, right? So people are playing around with it, and a couple uh, telegraph operators realized if they shut off the power to their te telegraph while the aurora was going on, they could actually still send messages back and forth. Thus That's proving so cool. that aurora is related to electric fields. It's so fucking cool. Yeah, so they actually, there's like, I don't have the text, but people, they, they recorded the text that they were actually able to send and then back and forth. Uh, I will what they use the almighty power of the sun. <laughs> and apparently they were able to do this for like two hours. Not, It wasn't like a couple minutes. It was they let it go for like two hours, sending messages back and forth without any power. Telegraphs required very little power, so that would make sense. So science, as in history science, not science that Hunter will go, go through in a minute, uh, Sir Edmund Haley, best known for Haley's Comment, Comet, not Comment. Haley's Comment. <laughs> That's pretty in the sky there. Yeah. That's Haley's Comment. Uh, in the 18th <laughs> no, century. No, wait. Haley's Comment first. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so he thought uh, auroral rays are due to particles, which are affected by magnetic field. Uh, the rays are running parallel to magnetic field, and uh, the vault shape is due to perspective phenomena. This was the next best estimate of what uh, was going on with Aurora. It's close. It's getting there. The Anders Celsius, best known for the Celsius temperature scale. I like this guy. Yeah? Yeah. I like C Celsius. Celsius. Don't like Fahrenheit is kind of a... Fahrenheit, Bad like, guy. the original invention of Fahrenheit was to make thermometers easier yeah, to make, it? and then they changed it so that now it's just as hard to make a Fahrenheit thermometer as it is to make a Celsius thermometer. So why do we even have Fahrenheit thermometers? <laughs> I don't know. USA! 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 Wow. <laughs> we do so many things that don't make any sense. It's true. Celsius, he actually connects aurora to the Earth's magnetic field. So we're getting closer. Magnetic field. Uh, Henry Cavendish uh, was the first person to estimate the actual altitude that aurora, specifically the aurora borealis, is at. Is that who the Cavendish banana is named after? I don't think so. Maybe. Hmm. Tried looking up what other stuff he uh, was famous for, but didn't, okay, didn't find you, anything. You so go 17... on. I'm going to find out if Henry Cavendish is. So he did this estimate in 1790, and his estimate was 100 to 130 kilometers, which I don't know what the actual height is or, or actual altitude, but that, apparently that's really close. 
Cavendish was known for doing this experiment to estimate the mass of the Earth. Huh. Bam. Oh, Smart yeah. Audience. It's known as the Cavendish experiment. Ooh. Boom. Nice. You're like a walking version of Wikipedia. I just read about this like a few days ago. <laughs> That's why it's fresh in my mind. Again, our audience is smarter than we are. <laughs> That's a good thing. It's like immediate waifu. Uh, <laughs> next jump in, in science for Aurora's by two people, two uh, scientists, Norwegian scientists, Christian uh, Birkeland and Carl Stormer. And I assume I'm saying the, his last name right because it, it's spelled Stormer, but it has the like two little dots. And I don't know how to pronounce those. No idea. So uh, Berkeland associated the nor- northern lights with a large system of electric currents. So there's electric currents covering all of Earth in near outer, sp- outer space. Uh, and the uh, aurora is caused by currents flowing through gas in the upper ab- atmosphere related to these, uh, these currents. So electric currents. By and, the way, I just looked it up and... No, Cavendish bananas were named after William Cavendish, the sixth Duke of Devonshire. Are they related? Probably. Cavendishes? Uh, well, I mean, everyone is related in some way. <laughs> Probably not that. We all have a common related. ancestor. <laughs> uh, Stormer, the other Norwegian scientist, uh, was able to calculate the direct trajectories. Ah. We got a lot of tough words today. Yeah, trade- we have trajectories. The best words not in our really podcast. that hard to say. I just can't speak, you know, which is why I'm on a podcast. It's <laughs> able to, to to calculate them of the electrically charged uh, particles. So which direction they're going, and that pretty much gets us until like some serious science that are very specific on on what's going on. So now we have a pretty good idea of what what's going on. I wanted to throw in the, the NASA and the, the Themis, Themis mission? Themis mission? Thermos. It's not <laughs> Thermos. There's no R there. Thermos. It's not Thermos. Uh, launched in February 17th, 2007 to study the Earth's aurorae. Specifically, how aurorae are caused. There's like substorms that appear in the Earth's magne- magnetosphere. And these, when they like erupt suddenly, they cause very large or very powerful aurora. And where they, NASA is trying to study why they happen. Now, even though this was launched in 2007, I didn't actually see what the results were. I guess they're still like working on the results of that mission. Do you have any? Uh, we actually, you know? uh, that mission succeeded in answering the question of what causes those. And I will go and discuss. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Yeah, it was weird. It was I, a I very saw, successful Like, mission. one of the links that I saw was, like, on NASA, and it was from, like, updated last year, and it just said, this is our mission. And there was no, like, info on when it was actually <laughs> launched or anything, or if there was any <laughs> info, you know, or if they hadn't got anything back from it. It was really weird. Uh, I wanted to throw in the, the mission name, Themis, is named after the Greek goddess, Themis. Well, it... It's an acronym, though. It's acronym. It's, it stands they, for Time was... History of Events and Macroscale Interactions During Substorms, because NASA loves acronyms. Loves your acronyms. Well, NASA is an acronym, so of course they love them. Of course. Anyways, she's a Greek goddess of justice. And I want to throw this in because, like, that you actually know – this goddess, you know the image of this goddess because it's oh, the very she's... famous one with scales. the sword and scales oh, nice. in most like courtrooms and, and stuff. And actually, originally she was not blindfolded. That was added later. Well, she's after the Greek period. She's blindfolded now. I remember that. That's kind of... Because Justice is Blind. You never oh, heard of that? Okay. And they, they put a blindfold on, on her. To blind say or blindfolded? Blindfolded. But that's not all. We've, we've actually discovered Aurora... Rory on other planets. Uh, I think most of them were discovered with the the Hubble Space Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble's Pace Telescope. Oh, Hubble's <laughs> uh, Slow down there. Going too fast, Hubble. The James Webb. 
space toast. We should start doing Dave, this. We should start doing this for all dogging. of them now. <laughs> so, so the Hubble Venu Space Telescope. Sand Mars. <laughs> Roy. Venus and Mars. The International Space Station. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So both Venus and Mars have aurorae, but Venus is unusual because it doesn't actually have a magnetic field, and its aurorae, aurorae are caused entirely by the solar wind, uh, which actually ends up falling back onto Venus on the you know the night side, and it lights up the the night side. And it's kind of a consistent color. It's not like bands and stuff it doesn't follow any field lines uh, of course jupiter and saturn have much stronger magnetic fields and they also have aurorae and the moons of jupiter have also been observed to have aurorae especially apparently io which its magnetic field actually interacts with jupiter's magnetic field and they both like their auroras are kind of like linked and i don't remember exactly how it works out, but they're, they're effect, they affect each other's aurora. But other moons, including Europa and Ganymede. Which, those are three of Jupiter's biggest moons. Correct. They're the Galilean moons that Galileo saw in a telescope. And, right. And caused yet another reason for him to get persecuted. Persecu <laughs> Look, other but stuff the, is orbiting it, other things. But Shut up, Galileo! <laughs> <laughs> Everything orbits Earth! <laughs> But it was mostly the Latin and Greek thing. <laughs> and we've actually seen aurora on distant stars. Uh, in the hmm. year, in July uh, 2015, we uh, detected one. I mean, we didn't really see it directly, but we did de detect one on a brown dwarf star with the wonderful name of LSR J1835 plus 3259. <laughs> oh, just rolls Good old up. LSR J1835 plus 3259. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That one. Uh, it's in the constellation Lyra. It's the Aurora was they detected. Is it Lyra or Lyra? Lyra, probably Lyra. Yeah. Sorry. Anyways, the, the Aurora was about a million times brighter than the Earth. So the Aurora. One, the Aurora. So they, the one that they detected. Yeah. <laughs> Although I think they probably detected multiple ones. Then you'd say the Aurora were. Oh. Fine. <laughs> Going back is a million times brighter than Earth's, which is the only way we were able to detect it. Why exactly a star has an Aurora is unknown and that is a uh ongoing question in in aurora science hmm. at the moment say it's gotta have something like oxygen in its in its corona right so it has the elements uh it's a brown dwarf so i don't think it's not as bright as other one other stars but exactly why it would have it since well our or the Earth's aurora and the other planets were caused um, by the sun, right? Yeah. Why would a star have it? Because it doesn't have, as far as I know, it does, it's not a binary star. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Get on it, yeah. NASA. I think there's some theories, uh, but there were none that were like definitive, so I didn't put anything down. So... If anybody from NASA knows and has like new science out and knows definitively what's going on, they can uh, let us know and we'll add it to a waifu. <laughs> if anyone at NASA is listening to our podcast, you rock. That's true. And keep doing what you do. And we're NASA's sorry awesome. for destroying names of like everybody <laughs> in science and stuff. Is had field. <laughs> <laughs> So, do you want to know how Aurora work? Yeah. Yes. Oh, my God. Aurora are so cool. <laughs> they are so freaking cool. Oh, my God. Aurora are so freaking cool. They're so goddamn cool. They're fucking amazing. How they work is so freaking awesome. It's, like, so much science and all of this, like, 
knowledge that we have about how they work. It's so goddamn interesting. Okay, ready? For the listeners, he just walked around the desk. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to tell you how they work. So wait, wait, wait. They're so freaking cool. Are they cool? They are! Oh, my God! (laughs) Aurora are so cool, and I really want to see one. If anyone listening would like to buy me a ticket to, to anywhere in the polar circle... Preferably in America and Alaska. But only a one-way ticket. No. No. <laughs> no. I want to come back. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I will gladly accept that as a gift to go see Aurora because they're freaking awesome. I'll probably just have to buy it myself. Probably. Go see an Aurora. I really want to see an Aurora. They're so cool. Okay, so, so to talk about Aurora, we got to talk about the sun because the sun is what makes Auroras. Okay. He's the painter of the painting of the Aurora. So, over at the sun, many, many miles away from Earth, or kilometers away from Earth. Because <laughs> it's uh, totally different. <laughs> also many kilometers, but How only one AU. Just one AU. Just the single a- oh, yeah. AU. Yeah. Astronomical unit. Which, if you're unaware, an astronomical unit is defined as the average distance from Earth to the sun. <laughs> so, it makes sense that... It's one AU one away. AU, yeah. So uh, in the sun, we got this nuclear fusion going on. That's what powers the sun. Uh, the gravity of the sun is pulling all this gas in on itself so much that the the protons, um, which are hydrogen atoms, because a proton is a hydrogen atom, um, the protons get so close together that they can overcome the electromagnetic force that's pushing them away and bind together with the, Wait, the strong nuclear force. So isn't like a proton really like a hydrogen ion? Yeah. Cause it, but an ion is atom. an atom. Okay. An ion is just a charged atom. It's just it's a proton without an electron. Yeah. Yeah. A proton just alone is a hydrogen atom. Okay. Or hydrogen ion if you prefer. Okay. Either one is correct. I do, but go for it. So, um, that uh, that fusion of these two hydrogen atoms uh, coming together to make, uh, I believe it's deuterium, and then deuterium, two deuterium atoms. Deuterium is hydrogen with uh, a, a neutron. Uh, uh, the, then two deuterium atoms coming together to make helium. Uh, all of those processes release an enormous amount of energy in the form why, of is photons. Is that why the, the sun talks in a funny high voice because of all the helium? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm the sun. Ho ho! Sun's not Mickey Mouse. <laughs> the sun is Mickey Mouse. <laughs> ho ho! <laughs> I like to fuse all my hydrogen. Woo! <laughs> so you get this light radiating outwards uh, from the sun, uh, from the the core of the sun towards these the outer layers. And uh, the the light that gets to the surface is so hot. The the or sorry, not the light. Uh, the all of that radiative heat heats up the entire sun, and it keeps it from falling in on itself. Okay. Um, so the sun is constantly radiating out this heat as well, um, in the form of visible light, uh, infrared light, ultraviolet light. Light. Yeah, light. Light. The sun emits light. Electromagnetic News flash. Waves. The sun emits light. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but that's not the only thing it emits. Unless it also Trump. emits something called the solar wind, which is this stream of particles, both electrons and protons and alpha particles as well. Which... So is, is that like the sun just like passing gas? Oh. Constantly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> 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 so the, these particles can escape the, the massive gravity of the sun because they're extremely high temperature. Like, we're talking over a million Kelvin. Wow. Which, in so case you're that? unfamiliar with Kelvin, it's basically Celsius, just minus, minus 273 degrees. Plus, right? You add 273 uh, to yeah. Celsius. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so you take Celsius and you add 273.15 degrees, and you get Kelvin, Kelvin, which is not measured in degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvin. Uh, So it's in excess of 1 million Kelvin, so it's very hot gas, very hot plasma. Approximately a million Celsius. It's actually, it's not not gas, it's plasma. (laughs) 
Him so um, I, w- I want to make that distinction because plasma is different than gas. Gas it's a- um, is not ionized. Plasma is ionized. So all the electrons and the, the atoms aren't uh, connected together. They're, they're just kind of floating around. Um, plasma is actually a fourth state of matter. Yes, right? it's a different yes. state of matter than gas. Right. Um, so this hot plasma gets ejected from the sun um, and causes the solar wind, which is constant. The solar wind is always going on, um, almost always, but we'll get to that. Okay. Uh, so the solar wind is actually what causes comets to have tails. Ooh. It strips off all this... Uh, all this gas and dust from the comets and that creates this big long tail that we see and we go, Ooh, pretty. <laughs> so I say every time I see a comet. <laughs> That's what I say. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, the solar wind is traveling at 350 ish to 750 ish kilometers per second. So very, very, very fast. Right. Obviously not as fast as light, but very fast. And it's going to stick cl- to kilometers per second. So yeah. we're not going I'm not, back into I'm miles not translating and, that. Yeah. We, we did that in the other episodes. We're done. <laughs> if you want, you can just Google it. 350 right. kilometers per second to miles per second. Just Google that. Um, so in addition to the solar wind, though, we have something called a coronal mass ejection or a CME or a solar storm. So um, that's just like the, the sun ejaculating all over the solar system. In a way, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Totally. Okay. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like how there's, here. like, silence after that. Like, nothing. Oh, I come here, know. Venus. I'm gonna... I'm gonna I got something okay. for you, Venus. It should be Pluto. <laughs> oh! It should be Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, come here, Pluto. <laughs> this oh, is definitely God, getting cut, terrible. isn't it? <laughs> We're so terrible. <laughs> so <laughs> how these CMEs form, these coronal mass ejections, um, is they start in the, the, lower, the lower of the outer layers of the sun, <laughs> uh, where these, these huge eddies of plasma are caused by uh, these convection currents of gas rising and and cooling off and lowering and heating up and rising again. So you get these giant eddies of this charged plasma in something called a convection cell in this giant area inside the sun where this plasma is just roiling around and it's, it creates these enormous magnetic fields because when you get charged stuff moving around, it creates a magnetic field. So these magnetic fields can build up. And in some places, they can be so strong that they push up through the surface of the sun and come out into space. And they can guide the, these big pockets of plasma around the sun. And that's where we get sunspots because that, uh, that magnetic field coming out of the surface of the sun slows down the eddy. So you get these sunspots where the the surface has cooled enough to be darker than than uh, other areas of the sun so this plasma drags the field more outward away from the surface of the sun and when it gets too far you can get what's called magnetic reconnection where the the magnetic field will become too elongated that it can't keep its structure and it'll kind of pinch in on itself and collapse into two magnetic fields and that allows it to release an enormous amount of energy that it's built up both back into the sun and out into space and when you get that huge magnetic field carrying all this hot plasma ejected into space that's what's called a coronal mass ejection or a sun ejaculation right as we have to term (laughs) So this coronal mass ejection can travel fast enough to reach Mercury in six hours, and then mm-hmm. Venus in 12 hours, and Earth in 18 hours. It's ejected oh, from the sun. Like, it's matter. It's not light. It's not traveling at the speed of light. It's ejected from the sun, 
and it can reach Earth only 18 hours later. So wait, wait, wait. How long does it take for light from the sun to get to the Earth? About eight minutes. Okay. So, so it's light is fast, really fast. It's not nearly not as light. fast as light. Okay. Which is a good thing because we can actually predict them by watching this happen on the sun. And then we go, oh, shoot, that's directed our way. Right. Quick, right. put all our satellites in. Then we have 18 in, hours in to do CME something about it. Prediction mode or whatever okay. it's called. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Coronal mass ejaculation protection. <laughs> it's basically put a, a condom. condom on. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, put a condom over all the satellites. Would a sock work too? <laughs> <laughs> yes. All the satellites just have a tube sock that they can cover themselves. <laughs> Those aren't solar sails. <laughs> So, uh, to, to sidetrack, to get away from uh, the sun doing its thing, <laughs> we just did here, <laughs> here on Earth, we're not on Earth, but in Earth, way down in the, the core of Earth, you got all this liquid metal, which the core of Earth is very hot, and it's made of metal, iron, and uh, various other... Wait, it's not hell? It is not. <laughs> <laughs> it is not hell. Okay. <laughs> but it is liquid molten metal. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you get this big liquid metal that spins because the Earth is spinning, and it's uh, you you get uh, the spinning metal which is charged, and it's creating a magnetic field. So the Earth also has magnetic field, and that magnetic field is what we call the magnetosphere, and that magnetic field can actually trap radiation from the the solar wind in what's called a Van Allen radiation belt. The Van Allen radiation belt is the name of Earth's radiation belt. Other planets also have radiation belts, but ours is named Van Allen radiation belt after Van Allen, the guy who discovered it. Mm-hmm. Um, so the radiation belt is this donut-shaped ring of charged particles, and it's held in place by our magnetosphere, this big magnetic field that's around mm. Earth. It's not just like a big like sphere of magnetos from X-Men. Holding or magnetrons from or microwaves. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, the mag- the radiation belt is mostly made of protons and electrons, uh, since those are charged particles. So they're very easy to hold in place uh, in a radiation belt. So the the main belts on Earth are from about one thousand to sixty thousand kilometers high. They're they're very high up. Very, very high up. Much, 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 much higher than the ISS. Right. Actually, the the edge of space is 100 kilometers. It's like kind of the yeah. So boundary. much further so than the 10 edge times of... to six, 600 times. <laughs> Although the edge of space is kind of like. It's not a defined, yeah. like really hard to find line. Like it's something we just kind of decided on. But yeah. we were just like, let's just make this the edge of space. Right. Because it's like taking a rainbow and trying to decide where, like, orange becomes yellow. What's next or... to it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had, to, I had to think about that. I had to, <laughs> to think, Roy G. Biv. Uh, orange and yellow. There we go. So you can't just look at a spot and go, like, that, to the right of that is yellow, to the left of it is orange. Like, you got to right. kind of decide, like, okay, right about here-ish. So we did that. We were just like, eh, 100 kilometers up. Yeah. So the magnetosphere is – it bathes the Earth. It's, it's like the magnetosphere is part of – like it emanates from the center of the Earth. So it includes the Earth in it, and it extends much further out from the Earth. And if we didn't have a solar wind, it would be shaped like a donut. Okay. So, so. on a planet that has a magnetic field surrounding it that doesn't have a star – solar wind to push on it it would just the magnetic field or the magnetosphere would just look like a donut or a big torus uh it would be uniform in all directions but the sun would only cops uh, be on that planet what's that would only cops be on that planet because giant (laughs) donut (laughs) that was was really bad (laughs) um so ours is not shaped and any planet with a star that has a magnetosphere is or any planet with a magnetosphere that has a star is not going to be shaped like that because the star is pushing uh the star's solar wind is 
providing pressure on this magnetosphere and it's it's pushing it into a, a different shape. So it still kind of looks like a donut, but if you stretched the back of the donut really far and elongated it, so it's this long, thin donut esque comet tail looking kind of thing. It's kind of hard to describe, but I hope you can picture it. This, if you took a donut and just stretched the back of it really far, that's what our magnetosphere looks like. And that stretch can be really, really far. In fact, Jupiter's magnetosphere is stretched so far that it reaches all the way to Saturn's orbit. Wow. Really far away. In case you didn't know, Jupiter is about as far from Saturn as it is from the sun. Wow. Yeah, it is very far away. And the magnetosphere will deflect these uh the solar wind and the solar the mass from the coronal mass ejection, the solar storm. So it's like the Earth's condom. <laughs> In a way, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uh it's the Earth's chastity belt maybe (laughs) so it will deflect the the particles from the the coronal mass ejection through something called the lorentz force and that deflection is what keeps the the solar storm from really damaging earth because we would be bathed in all this radiation if it weren't for our magnetosphere radiation so we we love our magnetosphere Thank you, Magnetosphere, for doing what you do. In the Magnetosphere, because it's stretched like this, the names of each side is different. There's what's called the Dayside Magnetosphere, which looks like half a donut. Kind of. It, it's much more toroidal shape, but it's kind of like half a donut if you squished in the front of it. You like squish the side of a donut or something? Yeah, if you squish the front of a donut and you pull on the back of it, that's what our... Right our magnetosphere looks like and the name for the front half the half that's squished because of the the pressure of the solar wind is the day side magnetosphere which is not nearly as cool a name as the other side the big long part the big stretch side it's not called the night side magnetosphere it's called the magneto tail such a cool name so the coronal mass ejection, if it hits Earth, it'll deform the magnetosphere in what's called a geomagnetic storm. And it can, be, it can deform our, our magnetosphere so much that even a compass can become erratic. So you can have oh, no. incorrect readings on your compass because of this coronal mass ejection slamming into the, the magnetosphere of our planet. Um, how, would, and, how long would that last? Like if you're out on a boat and for some reason you only had a compass and not GPS, like we discussed in a previous podcast. <laughs> it could last as long as a few hours. Okay. Depending on how big the, the CME is. Okay. Um, and it's not the only thing that can cause a, uh, a geomagnetic storm. You can also get um, solar wind that's a little bit faster than other solar wind. Um, and it can overtake the slower solar wind and cause these eddies of turbulence um, of these magnetic particles out in, or electric particles, electrical particles out in space. And that can interact with our magnetosphere and cause turbulence and create a geomagnetic storm. So now we've got the particles from the CME hitting our magnetosphere. And now To bring them down into the atmosphere, there's two ways that they can get through this big condom. (laughs) This big earth condom. It's like this big earth condom has two big holes in it. It's not an extremely effective (laughs) condom. Not very useful at all. (laughs) That's how life started. But hey, it, it gives us auroras. So we like it. So on the daytime side, the side facing the sun, in case you don't know what daytime means... Um, on that side, we have the, the day-side magnetosphere. And remember, I, should, I said it was shaped like an elongated donut? Yeah, you've mentioned that a few S- times. A squished on one side and elongated on the other side donut. Well, donuts have a hole in the top and the bottom. Right. They have a cusp. And the magnetic field lines of the Earth 
will normally connect to the opposite pole. So the the magnetic field lines coming out of the south pole will connect to the lines on the north pole and they'll create this ring like the donut. Like if you take a an intersection of a donut, it's going to look like a ring. Right. So normally those field lines would just connect like that. Uh, but sometimes those lines, especially if they're pushed by the by a solar storm, can disconnect from each other and connect instead to um, the interplanetary magnetic field, which Ooh. is generated by the sun and is carried by the solar wind. You have this interplanetary magnetic field that's kind of permeating space, interplanetary, interplanetary space, and our field lines can connect to it. And so where like connected to the other planets in some like in force. Min, in more ways than one. Well, oh, okay, gravity and electromagnetism. Okay, yep. that would be not two. the strong force time. and not the weak force. Well, kind right. of the weak force, not not really. Okay, so the, the where the the field lines go from connecting to the other pole to connecting to the lines out in space, they'll create this opening called a cusp, and the cusp on the day side magnetosphere can allow particles to funnel down through it into our atmosphere. Oh no. And that is how you can get uh, a daytime aurora, but daytime auroras, you can't really see. They're not right. bright enough to see. Yeah, I don't in remember the daytime. like much about daytime aurora auroras. Yeah. You only really see them at night unless you're yeah. looking with special equipment. Okay. Uh, so on the nighttime side, there is no cusp, so we're not going to get aurora from from that interaction. It's got to use something else. So these these field lines that connect with the interplanetary magnetic field stretch back in this long tail. Like if you imagine looking at the tail of a comet and just drawing lines down the tail, they'll extend back really far. Um, and when the pressure on the front of our magnetosphere is so much that it it breaks one of the the mag magnetic field lines that's connected to the other pole and connects instead to the interplanetary magnetic field, it can sweep back and push on the magneto tail, push down on it, making it uh, making the, the innermost field lines become kind of overloaded. They're not powerful enough to keep their shape, and they'll do... The same Dude. thing that the sun did to create this CME, they'll, the, it'll cause magnetic reconnection. Hmm. Where the so two... does that look like the, the tail's wagging or something? No. Oh. <laughs> that would have been cool. It would have been, but it's not how it works. <laughs> oh, okay. But it does kind of look like the tail also ejaculates. <laughs> So you, you get this magnetic reconnection where these two lines that are coming out of each pole, these two field lines that come out of each pole and extend back behind the planet can reconnect. And the, the part that's towards uh, space gets ejected out into space. And the part that's the part of the, uh, those field lines that's towards Earth, when they reconnect, it'll snap back towards Earth. And that action of it snapping back towards Earth carries a ton of these particles from the CME and also from our own radi radiation belt, the, the Van Allen radiation belt. Uh, you'll get these, these particles carried back from those, that, that field line snapping back and it'll fall down onto the earth. And that's where the nighttime auroras come from. Wow. Those are the ones you can see. Um, so the, the particles are funneled down into a band around each pole called the auroral zone, which is why when you look at auroras, like when you look at a picture of an aurora from space, it just looks like a big ring around the, the pole. I didn't see too many. Uh, I, I don't know if I've seen pictures. I think I've seen like one or two pictures from space of aurora. Oh, you've got to watch them. The, the International Space Station has some awesome videos of them flying really? over auroras it's so fucking beautiful so is it like moving while they're yes oh, and it's cool. so goddamn gorgeous makes me cool. really want to be an astronaut <laughs> maybe we can add a link to under yeah the we should do that i'm gonna put a link in the show notes of videos of the iss 
flying over auroras because it's so freaking gorgeous. So now you'll have these particles streaming down into our atmosphere. And when they do that, they can collide with ions and atoms and molecules in our atmosphere. When they do that, the collisions will excite the the ions and the, the molecules in our atmosphere. The ions and atoms and molecules. Oh, my. <laughs> and as no. the, the atoms and the molecules fall back to their normal energy state from their excited state, they'll release a photon. And those mm-hmm. photons are the light that makes up the aurora. It seems really complicated to get to pretty lights in the sky. <laughs> but it's so cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So most of the light from auroras is produced at about 90 to 200 kilometers above the Earth. So in that band, you get most, or in that uh, altitude range, you get most of the the light that's produced. But sometimes they can extend all the way up to 1,000 kilometers high. Wow. Very high. And since they're along Earth's field lines they'll usually look like these long flowy curtains or ribbons that are stretching from east to west. But they can also appear as just like a a diffuse light. Okay. Or even as arcs, like was on that coin. Right. And one time we've seen it even appear as just a giant blob directly over the pole. People freak out. They're like, oh, my God. No, it is really freaky because what causes that is if the solar wind disappears. Oh, wow. And that happened. Wait, wait. wait. What happens? The solar wind disappears. The solar wind disappeared. But you can still have an aurora. But I guess it's a mass ejection. Because now if the solar wind disappears, the shape of the magnetosphere becomes more donut-like. And the solar wind back in May 10th to May 12th, 1999 – the solar wind dropped by like 98%. Wow. It was down to 2%, its normal strength. It freaked us out. We, did, <laughs> we don't know why that happened. Wow. But it happened, and you had this aurora that was just a big blob directly over the North Pole. Wow. I think that's sort of like how the, the Venus aurora looks like, except it's not on the poles. It's just on the... The night side. Just a big diffuse blob? Yeah. That would make sense, since it, if There's it doesn't no have a magnetic. magnetosphere, it wouldn't right. create these bands. Yeah. So the aurora can the aurora can be a lot of different colors. And based on the color and the altitude of that color, you can determine what ions or molecules are emitting them. So oxygen at high altitude just an oxygen atom at high altitude, which is about above 300 kilometers-ish, emits a brownish-red photon, which is 630 nanometers in wavelength. Wouldn't it just be red? Because the brown is the dull, it's just lack of intensity. It's a, it's a, it's a red that's really close to, to orange, so oh, it's kind okay. of brownish. If you see a deep red, that's a different one. Uh, So at at lower altitudes, above about 100 kilometers, but below 300 kilometers, oxygen atoms will emit green, which is about 557.7 nanometers. And that's the most common color you'll see in an aurora. Yeah, I remember seeing a lot of pictures of green. Yep, that's oxygen. Um, and red and green light from oxygen can mix and produce yellow light. Ooh. So you can get you can get yellow auroras when you see both of those. So it can take an oxygen atom up to two minutes to emit a red photon. So in the lower altitude where there's more oxygen, it'll be a lot more likely for that oxygen atom to collide and lose its energy than to emit a red photon, which is why red really only happens above about 300 kilometers. Um, you can compare that to about three, quarter of a, three quarters of a second to emit a green 
photon. So it's much more likely that it'll it'll collide before it emits red than before it emits green. Okay. So atomic oxygen becomes much more rare below about 100 kilometers. So the bottom of the light of the aurora will end pretty abruptly, which is why it gives it that appearance of curtains. Ah. The bottom will just atomic, cut right off. Did you explain what atomic oxygen is? It's just versus... an an oxygen atom versus an O2 molecule. Okay. So oxygen oftentimes is combined with itself, connected to itself. Yeah, that's what we breathe is O2. Yeah. So but it's higher altitudes. It can be just an oxygen lurking around. Yep. Just a single oxygen atom going about his going, business. I'm so lonely. I'm going <laughs> to give off some light. No. Yeah. At least they get to paint the sky. Yeah, it's true. So nitrogen atoms, uh, between about 100 kilometers to about 300 kilometers, so the same altitude that oxygen emits green light, uh, nitrogen ions will emit several wavelengths of both blue and violet light. So if you see blue and violet light, you're looking at a nitrogen aurora, or nitrogen in the aurora. Uh, An N2, a nitrogen atom bonded to itself, an N2 molecule in low altitudes will emit several wavelengths of deep red or crimson, as well as some blue light uh, with 428 nanometers blue light dominating. But still, if you see like a deep red or a crimson, that is N2 molecules. Okay. So it's red that's, farther from orange is going to be yes yeah more in the infrared side yeah closer to infrared and at at low altitudes blues and purples are common in high solar activity so if those charged particles can make it all the way down to the low atmosphere so if i if i tracked all the colors i think orange is the only one that doesn't show up well you could you can mix combining okay. yeah you can mix red green and blue which show up to make pretty much any color so an red, aurora right. could be any color yeah because red green and blue is the at least the perceived by our eyes colors. an aurora could be any color right and nitrogen and oxygen also give off ultraviolet light and infrared heat radiation so they're giving off light that we can't even see as well imagine if we could see that how cool that would look <laughs> God, that'd be awesome. Or a big disappointment. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh, that's not what I thought it would look like at all. I think it well, would probably look, not. It, it would look would awesome. Cool. We'd, seeing new colors would look yeah. so cool. Let me up. <laughs> exactly. So if you shine like a black light into the sky with that, no, yeah, that wouldn't work. Well, for the uh, fluids, just the be fluids. <laughs> <laughs> So Aurora. Aurorae can also produce radio colored light. What? Because in case you're unaware, radio is a color of light. I mean it's it's a wavelength, so a wavelength is a color. So it's a color of light. It's just a color radio that we waves. can't see. Yeah. Radio oh. waves are just colored light. They're right. just a color that we can't see. But do do they do they make microwaves? I don't know. <laughs> the sun is microwaving us. Maybe. Maybe. Probably. Probably. <laughs> uh, so that light, the uh, the uh, radio waves are around 150 kilohertz. So you could probably listen to them on some radios. But that uh, that probably, radiation is called auroral kilometric radiation. Probably so, just a hissing sound. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if it was like... <laughs> welcome (laughs) you've got mail (laughs) all of our listeners below the age of like 20 are like what the fuck was that (laughs) so you need billions of these collisions with between these high energy particles usually electrons uh and and the ions and molecules in our our atmosphere to create enough light 
that it's bright enough for humans to see. So when you see Aurora, that is billions of collisions of particles from the sun with particles in our atmosphere. Wow. So goddamn cool. But even so, Aurora are not bright enough to see during the day. Oh. So you unless you have even special equipment ones. or something is really going wrong with the Earth's magnetic field, <laughs> um you're not going to see aurora during you're not going to see any aurorae during the day. Okay. But you can hear them. <gasps> Auroras also make sounds. Like sounds that you can hear if you're outside. Yeah. They wow. make like a crackling and like a hissing sound. <laughs> no, they don't make that sound. <laughs> Please do that closer to the mic so our listeners can hear. Oh god. Why do you want that sound on our podcast? <laughs> Because otherwise, our listeners will not know what you're talking about. I apologize to all the listeners yeah, who that, just that had to suffer bad. through that. <laughs> but yeah, they can make a crackling and a hissing noise. So if you're watching an aurora and you hear that, that's the sound produced by the aurora. Wow. So yeah, that now you all know how our aurora are made. Aurora. Aurora. My mind is now blown. Wee-oo! Somebody did that to the sun. Oh, God. <laughs> so do we have any actual questions from our audience? We don't have a waifu. Yeah. Any audience members with questions? What, uh, uh, how, did it reach, how did it reach New York? What, what made it special, the Aurora, to, meet, to, to reach New York? Um, Aurora have actually been seen in Hawaii. So yeah. even a lot further south than New York. Yeah. Uh, so the Egyptians might have been able to see it. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, so what happens to create an aurora that powerful is just an enormous coronal mass ejection aimed right at Earth. If that happens, you can get an aurora that basically covers the Earth. Wow. Also, when I was reading, uh, particularly about the uh, the Philip of Macedonia one, um, as I said, you know they saw the a very bright aurora, but apparently. The Earth's magnetic poles were in different location at that time, uh, and that allowed like the northern lights to be much further south. Mm. But that would not happen today. I well, believe unless, that's our, where, unless what was the, going on. the poles shifted suddenly, and, and the Earth is destroyed, and the, the Earth wouldn't get no, destroyed. I mean, that happens, and <laughs> it's just it's just a thing that happens. There was a disaster movie that was like that. I'm like, but the core. it just, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The core. The, yeah. Oh, no. God, that was the... an awful movie. <laughs> so bad. That was my first date. <laughs> <laughs> Did not go well. Your first date ever? Yeah, my first date ever. I watched that movie. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she left. <laughs> Hopefully you left with her. No. Because that movie was uh, so bad. I'll, I'll tell you later uh, <laughs> how, any more questions yeah yeah yeah. Uh, uh so you mentioned that aurora didn't happen for a long time un- until the printing press was developed there there Could was a been... drop in recorded observations yeah. and there were some so there's definitely happening it's not real clear at least from what i was reading whether or not it was actually a big drop in aurora or if it, you know, the record people weren't keeping records, or the records were lost. But once the printing press was invented, then these records could be multiplied all over. I know there was like apparently a fairly popular book that was uh, written and produced with the printing press that was uh, got around, became a bestseller. You know, Gutenberg bestseller, I guess. <laughs> Could could the development of the printing press have caused the aurora? <laughs> no, no, I don't believe that would happen in any way. <laughs> you got something? Yeah, I got a question for you. Yeah. You say that obviously that solar storms lead up, lead to aurorae once they hit the Earth, but is do do the aurorae always occur following a solar storms? Following a solar storm? Uh, not if the solar storm doesn't hit the Earth. Okay. If it hits the Earth. It's pretty much always going to cause an aurora. Okay. Aurora actually happen all the time, but we can't see them all the time. 
they're not bright enough to see. They're really only bright enough to see when there's a lot of solar activity. I have a related question. Like, do we know, are we able to predict solar storms to some effect? Like, you want to get a plane ticket to go north to, to see Aurora, but do you know when you go up there, you're actually going to be able to see them? Or do you have to stay for a certain amount of time? Or We can, we, we know when there will be a lot of solar activity. So okay. we can predict when Aurora will be more common. And we know when a solar, uh, a coronal mass ejection happens, we can tell a couple days before it'll reach earth because uh, light travels faster than the coronal mass well, you ejection. You said it was like 18 hours. 18 right. hours is the fastest. Okay. okay. Uh, it'll usually be a little longer than that. Okay. So we can watch one happen and then we'll know within a couple days advance notice or 18 hours if it's very fast uh, that it's coming. And we can tell when the sun will be in its most active uh, cycle, when the most active part of its cycle. So if you want to go see an aurora, check when the sun is going to be most active. And then if you really only want to see an aurora and want to take no chance that you won't see one, then you'll only have a couple days advance notice. Okay. Is the magnetosphere weak in certain spots? Is that why auroras happen up north down south? Um, it's not a, f a factor of its weakness. It's a factor of where the field lines are produced. So the field lines will only come out of the poles. Um, just like a bar magnet, if you, if you stick a bar magnet near some iron filings, the iron filings will, will gather along these lines that go from pole to pole. These kind of circular-ish shaped lines. I've seen those before, yeah. So those lines where they intersect with our atmosphere are always near the pole. So is is there any risk where the solar wind is is happening there of of uh, uh, beta particles or whatever coming down and hitting you? Is that them being used up in the atmosphere completely? I think you mean alpha particles. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll do that. Alpha particles, protons, and electrons. Yeah. Uh, there would only be a risk if there was an extremely large coronal mass ejection. And really, you're you're only at risk if uh, there's both an extremely large coronal mass ejection and you're in a plane. Mm. If you're high enough in the atmosphere that the particles will hit you. Like um, you're flying over the North Pole. Yeah. When it happens. Yeah. Um, and if there ever is an extremely large coronal mass ejection, they won't let you fly over the North Pole. Mm. I mean... It's too dangerous. Yeah. It, you will get a dose of radiation that you shouldn't get. But so will the plane. Yes. And all the other particles. I'm less worried about the plane. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you're on the ground, you're you're perfectly safe. All right, you mentioned that aurorae can make sounds. Were you, to be clear, were you saying that they're audible with the unaided ear? Yes. Wow. Yeah, they, they're produced not as high as the light from an aurora. Um. I can't remember their altitude. It, it wasn't very high. Uh, but yeah, you can hear them just with your naked ear. Yeah. What about your clothed ear? Uh, if you have earmuffs on, you probably won't hear them. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> this, is, this is tangential, but uh, is there any reason that molecular oxygen is more prevalent in the atmosphere? Uh, I'm actually not sure. I think think it has to do with the pressure right. but i'm not pressure sure or is it when it's higher up in the atmosphere it's bombarded with more radiation and such and, and it actually separates some molecules i don't know one of the others. honestly i don't know why they're there it shifts from atomic to mon to molecular at a certain altitude yeah, that's a random question that came up and then, um, can can you speculate how that how that telegraph was working without power? I, I've always thought that that Morse code was like brief pulses of electricity that you're sending across. How, right. How does that so work? what I could 
tell it wasn't like super clear from what I, the text I was reading, but the telegraph was oriented correctly. So you couldn't just have like any random like telegraph wire in any direction, but it was oriented correctly so, such that the Aurora power would, would actually send electricity through the, the line. And I believe telegraph is actually your connecting and disconnecting the circuit, right? Is that how it works? Yeah. It's some, yeah. It's something like so, that. Yeah. So you're so, sending brief pulses of electricity. Right. So if there's electricity that's trying to flow through the, the circuit uh, and you're connecting and disconnecting it, it's still going to work, right, as long as you have some sort of power source. And that's basically what was happening. The, the Aurora was pushing the electrons through, and when they actually connected the, the circuit, it actually worked. That's crazy. Yeah, that was a really cool story. Earth, batteries included. That's right. <laughs> Oh, um, what is the minimum latitude north or south that you can see auroras? I mean, I know like a, a particularly powerful aurora you, you could spot like from Egypt, but like, but an average, like, what would be like like how far north or how far south do you have to be to see the borealis or the Australis? Aus- Australis? Australis. Australis. Yeah, it's like Australia without the uh, and an is. Instead, oh, Australis, Australis, yeah, Australia. yeah, the aurora. <laughs> <laughs> What's the minimum uh, latitude? Or you can just go with southern lights. <laughs> oh, thank you. Southern it's a lot lights. easier to say, even southern if it's not as cool. Lights. Any idea? I'm, I'm just stalling for time while Hunter <laughs> actually looks this up on on Google. Um, so auroras. I don't know the latitude, but I can give you the degrees from the pole. Um, auroras generally happen between 10 and 20 degrees from the geomagnetic poles. Okay. So the geomagnetic poles are not actually the North and South poles. They're off. There's the magnetic pole and then there's the axial pole, I think it's called. Yeah. Uh, basically it's where is the magnetic field coming from? is right. the the north pole and south pole and where is the axis upon which or around which earth is rotating is the axial north and south pole right so you'd want to be within 10 to 20 degrees of the magnetic poles right to see aurora and i want to say the magnetic north pole is in canada i don't think it's that far south well i, I think mean it's like pretty like near really the... north canada but it's like <laughs> i think it's pretty pretty far... near i don't think it is i don't think it's that it's close north. we'll have to look that up yes any other questions while uh, hunter looks up the answer that you know you can ask me because he's he's busy but, so you know, uh why he's... isn't the daytime magnetosphere called magneto head does that mean if magneto <laughs> tail <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Because I'm sure everyone would... Because the sun doesn't want to get Magneto head. It only wants some Magneto tail. Oh! Oh. (laughs) Give Magneto head or Magneto tail to Earth. So it's like, why can't Earth get Magneto head? Or, well, you know... You're welcome, Charles. Friend (laughs) zone. Universe universe zone. Magnetic North is almost to canada but not quite okay it's still fairly close to to axial north is it calling it axial north but i don't know if that's actually what it's called is it uh is it marked on like google maps is that how you're saying it Uh, um there's just diagrams of it if you if you search for where is magnetic north you can see the magnetic put in the show notes a link just can google it oh, okay. <laughs> can we put a link to let me google that for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll do that okay <laughs> any more questions all right well uh, i believe that will wrap up our show on aurora yay Woo! hope your mind is blown thank you matt thank you hunter 
And we want to thank Cyber SDF for letting us use their song Welcome and Mellow Acid as our intro and outro music. And we would also like to thank our studio audience. And we especially want to thank you listening at home. I hope you are all paying attention because this will all be on the test. Encyclopedia Podcastica is a production of the Silicon Valley Skeptics, an organization dedicated to promoting science and critical thinking. You can find us on Twitter at SB Skeptics or Facebook at facebook.com slash SB Skeptics. You can contact us at svskeptics at gmail.com. If you like the show, please rate us on iTunes. Hi everyone, this is Hunter.